Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books, where each week we interview an author of a newly published work of nonfiction that we believe is worth your time. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the University of Texas Brownsville or this station. And now, here is your host, Dr. Bill Strong. Welcome to Good Books Radio. I'm Dr. W.F. Strong. Uh, today we have a real exciting guest for you, Scott Jurek, who's one of the top ultra marathoners in the world, and some would say the top ultra marathoner in the world. His book is called Eat and Run, and you're going to want to get this because it's a it's a marvelous read. It will change your life. So, uh, Scott, how are you today? Well, I'm doing great. Uh, it's great to be here. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, could you first define ultra marathoner as composed to as compared to marathoner, so that uh, everyone will understand uh, the extreme nature of the sport? Yeah, basically, an ultra marathon is anything over the marathon distance, and for the most part, they start at fifty kilometers, which is thirty-one miles, go on up to fifty miles, hundred miles, um, even beyond. So I've done races such as like the Badwater; it's one hundred and thirty-five miles. The Spartathlon, one hundred and fifty-three miles. So. The, the races really depend, and then there's, of course, 24-hour races, 48-hour races, mm-hmm. six-day races where you're racing against the clock and trying to put as many miles in during that time frame. And how many uh, ultra marathons have you won, like 15, something like that? Oh, I've kind of lost track <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as far as numbers go. Uh, I've done a lot of many, many. going on 20, 20 years of racing, oh. and yeah, you know, I do a lot of small races and, of course, you know, major titles, definitely, mm-hmm. you know, that's well over a dozen, uh, like you said, maybe 15, 16, I think, in terms of major races. But, yeah, I've, you know, I've won a lot of races over the years. But, um, you know, it's, it's really about the journey and, you know, the mm-hmm. overall experiences that I've had. It, you know, as much as winning is fun, uh, you know, all the miles and the places that I've seen and just, you know, the struggles and adversity that one goes through in these events is really, I think, the, the unique thing and probably the most rewarding thing about them. Well, I think that's the shocking element for me in reading your book is to realize that the human body is capable of running for 24 hours. I, I just couldn't conceive of that. It is, it is you know, unusual for a lot of people to think that, okay, we, you know, we were built for these ultra-long distances. But, you know, as, you know, a lot of, you know, countless people have been doing over, you know, upon thousands of years of, you know, foot travel and, and mm-hmm. human exploration, you know, we know the body, the human body has been built for endurance and, you know, even more specifically ultra endurance and, you know, our ability to cool ourselves, our ability to, um, you know, stay moving at a very efficient pace is something that's, you know, a huge advantage. And, you know, Chris McDougall and Born to Run, you know, mentioned this obviously and, and did a whole section, you know, related to what what humans throughout the years have you know, been able to accomplish. And I guess it's just Ultramarathoning is maybe the, the modern <laughs> retapping into those primal ways and the ability of uh, the human body to you know, travel ultra-long distances running and on foot. Well, uh, Chris McDougall uh, said in his book that, and that was another astounding fact, was that people can outrun horses for the reason that you talked about. It's true. In fact, I, when I ran the Western States 100, back in 2004 and ran 15 hours and 36 minutes that's nine nine minute 22 second miles so those who are mm. familiar with that mile pace and that's over rocky rudy terrain you know 18,000 feet of climbing they hold a, a horse race that covers that same distance uh, a, a month later mm-hmm. and i essentially had run faster than the horses and the you know there are races actually in such in, as in vermont where they actually hold a horse 100 miler alongside of the the foot and the uh, the running hundred miler. So they, there's been this kind of I think uh, you know challenge as well as interest to see okay can humans really <laughs> outrun horses if we yeah. go long enough? And that's the big thing we have to. Yeah, we have it's got to go long, long enough. enough. Exactly. Because you can hydrate. Is that the thing? Yeah, horses can hydrate too, but um, we're we're much more efficient at cooling our bodies. You know, mm-hmm. if people think of their you know their household pets such as a dog, for mm-hmm. instance. I've you know run, and I mentioned this in Eat and Run, uh, running with mm-hmm. my, my dog Tonto, how, you know, he was able to do these 40-mile training runs as long as it was cool, and, you know, dogs pant to cool themselves. They don't yes. sweat. So the, the real big advantage for humans versus any other mammal out there is that we sweat, mm-hmm. um, and that's our ability to, to cool our body, and that's, you know, 
we actually, when I do races such as Badwater and run through Death Valley when it's 125 degrees, uh, in addition to sweating, we cool the body by that. pouring water over it. Yeah, I don't see how you so, can survive that. I mean, I've been out in Death Valley and I've just gotten out of the car and I can't, I can't stand there and breathe. You know, it's so oh, hot. It's, yeah, it feels. <laughs> I'll admit, I mean, it feels like a sauna. It feels like you know a blowtorch uh-huh. or uh, a hair dryer is blowing on you with uh, with that type of heat. And you know, it's one of those extreme situations of where they hold an event and they basically you know pit the human body against the the elements and extreme elements. And a lot of times, you know, ultra marathons are staged in environments such as that or high altitude, like the Hard Rock 100, which I mentioned in Eat and Run. You know. Basically, you're running at an average elevation of over 11,000 mm. feet for 100 miles and cross over a 14,000 foot peak and six passes over 13,000. So it's like breathing through a cocktail straw the whole time. <laughs> so we, we, we pit ourselves against these elements mm. to really challenge the body physically, but also I think mentally, uh, that's even probably more so, is just to see can, can we as humans get through these conditions? Well, for you, running is a spiritual thing, right? It is. I, I think, you know, I liken it, you know, a lot of people have, you know, their spiritual practice or they have uh, their their profession, their art form, uh, their hobby that is, you know, kind of meditative. It's it's a way of, you know, I guess tuning out for a while and, and running is definitely one of those things. It's, I love going out for a run and I think you don't have to run ultra marathons to experience this. You can go out for a, a two mile jog or you know, a hike up in the mountains or out on the trails or out in the woods and just, you know, it's that time to break away from the busyness of modern day life. And for me, it's it's a very like, meditative activity, even though some people might say, well, it's pretty boring and monotonous. I think sometimes getting to that, you know, more simple, boring state is actually beneficial, especially with, with all the modern technology and things we got going on with busy lives these days. One of the things I love about your book, uh, Eat and Run, is it reminds me of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which was a blend of philosophy <laughs> and journey. <laughs> and yours is yes. like that. You have philosophy weaved into this, uh, you know, William James and other uh, great philosophers like that. And I, I think that's inspiring to, to have the two blended this way. Well, well, definitely. Yeah, and I, I try to, I never thought running would take me the places that it has. And I mm-hmm. think I've always been trying to figure out going on 20 years of doing this sport and you know it's really the book was about me kind of having this you know experience and I used to hate running and mm-hmm. I used to hate vegetables and uh, here I'm running ultra marathons and I'm doing it on a plant-based diet so <laughs> I think it's that it's that journey that life takes us on and we have to you know, be willing to explore it and now you know writing this book it was me trying to figure out you know, why do I do these crazy events? And, you know, why do I challenge myself like mm-hmm. this? So I try to throw in some philosophy and, and ways of figuring out, okay, you know, why do why do I do the things that I do and kind of relate it to you know, why people choose the paths we choose. Well, I mean, let, let's just share one of these. Uh, in the opening of the, the prologue of your book, you have this quote from William James that says, Beyond the very extreme of fatigue and distress, we may find amounts of ease and power we never dreamed ourselves to own, sources of strength never taxed at all because we never pushed through the obstruction. Um, you're certainly the personification of that. You've pushed through. Yeah, and I think I, I think it's, it's one of those things everybody has. I, I'm a believer that anybody could run an ultra marathon. You know, maybe physically they'd have to you know, train a little bit, but mm-hmm. overall we we all have this ability. And whether it's running or whether it's some other vehicle we choose, you know, we have that ability to find those untapped sources of strength. And those, you know, obstructions are really things that we put in front of us, and you know, those barriers that we put down. So I think, yeah, William James was. Um, I, I just love that quote. It's, it's it one of those quotes quote. that really st- stuck with me because I think, you know, there are a lot of things in life that we, we put obstructions in front of us. And, you know, ultra marathoning obviously might be an, an easy metaphor for that quote, but it could really be anything in life. And we, you know, really just have to find that strength that all of us have and, and tap into it. You open your book with the story of the Badwater Ultra Marathon 2005, and you talk about being at that place, you know, kind of face down <laughs> uh, and uh, can't move, can't go any further. Uh, tell that story. Yeah, well, I had gotten uh, gotten into, you know, this situation where I was essentially, 
you know, vomiting, uh, you know, having a really rough state, 78 miles into the Badwater 135. So it's 135 miles that crosses Death Valley. You start at the lowest point, Badwater Basin, which is 240 feet below sea level. Mm. And then the the goal is to get to the base of Mount Whitney. The, the race used to finish on the top of Mount Whitney, which, of course, is the highest peak in the lower 48. And the, the whole idea was to go from the lowest to the highest point. And in that race, I had gotten to the point where I just, I, I was five miles behind the, the front runner um you can imagine being you know third or fourth place in a race and you're five miles behind i mean just mentally physically so i was so dehydrated you know feeling the effects of having run through the heat it's you know 10 past 10 o'clock at night it's still 100 plus degrees out and you know i was at that lowest spot that you can imagine you know imagine being in an event or some type of goal that you have and you think there's just no way, like, I'm going to have to hang it up, I'm going to have mm-hmm. to quit. And that's where I was at that point. Mm-hmm. And, you know, something, someone, you know, and I mentioned different factors, such as my buddy Dusty, um, you know, coming back and convincing me, like, okay, let's just go for a walk, let's just put one foot in front of the other. And it was me, you know, getting a little more fluids into my body and my crew helping me out with, okay, let's try and get the body back in order. But mentally, um, for you know, several minutes while I'm lying down, in the dirt of Death Valley, thinking this isn't going to happen. That won't ruin the story, but you know, mm-hmm. I I get up, start walking a little bit, mm-hmm. and uh, start moving again. I think that's much like life. You know, you we hit those low points when we think we can't go on, when mm-hmm. we can't get through the struggle or the the adversity that's going on, and you know, we just we have to put one foot in front of the other and and get back up and keep moving. Well, the, you talk a lot about obviously the power of the mind to shape destiny and achievement and you also tell an interesting story about uh, you know your your friend that you were you were i forget the the name for the for the uh, function that you're doing when you're coaching someone through the last 30 miles of the of are you spotting them what's the name for it you're oh pacing pacing, yeah, pacing. Yeah. so you, yeah in ultra marathons we have the you know you have a you don't always, but um, you can have the opportunity to have somebody pace you the last 40, 50 miles of an event, depending mm-hmm. upon the race. And it's the, you know, they're really, they're kind of your companion to help make sure you stay on the trail, mm-hmm. uh, you know, from a safety standpoint. Uh, but they can also be a source of motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, exactly, yep, I was out pacing. So, you talked about pacing this uh, friend of yours, and he gets almost to the end, and then he just can't make the last 100 yards or. Uh, and it's, uh, but you you have an interesting explanation for it that the mind sees the finish line, mm-hmm. and uh, can you explain that he, he, the mind sees the finish line and it it just uh, decides it can't go anymore? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's really tricky. Our our brains are one of our biggest assets as uh-huh. uh, as humans, and the you know, the psychology and the nervous system and, you know, just the brain function, we're still, like, we've learned just a fraction of what, um, you know, neuroscience is definitely advancing and we're learning a lot about the brain and the nervous system. But mm-hmm. in general, we, we still don't know everything. And the way I describe that situation, I had a similar experience where I was running the Grandma's Marathon up in Duluth, Minnesota, where I'm from. And it was one of those hot, muggy days, you know, 85 plus degrees and 90 plus percent humidity. And I got to about 150 yards from the finish line, and I started weaving. I was just so dehydrated Mm -hmm. and got to the point where I was weaving, kind of losing that ability to uh, stay focused. And at one point, um, I got within 40 feet of the finish line, and I just collapsed. And I don't think it was physically that my body just decided to quit at that moment. Um, I think what happened is my brain saw the finish line mm-hmm. and said, okay, you don't have to struggle anymore. You know, uh-huh. this dehydration is getting, you know, the red lights are flashing, for instance, uh-huh. like uh, they would be flashing your oil light on your car or something <laughs> like that. And, you know, the, the lights are going off saying, you know, we're, we're kind of on, uh, you know, last last kind of reserves here. And then you know, why couldn't I make it that last 40 feet? Literally, it felt like somebody had, you know, I, I just collapsed. I, it was almost as if somebody shot my legs out from under me, my. and I just collapsed there. And why was it 40 feet in front of the finish line? I think it because our our brain sees that finish line and says, you know what, We're you've done. made it. 
you mean? Yeah, we're, we're done. done here. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm good. And so I think that's, that's what happened to Brian as well. I mean, medically and physiologically, one could say, well, his body was taxed on all these physiological levels, you know, from the cardiovascular system to, uh, you know, the endocrine system and the kidneys, but which definitely get stressed in ultramarathoning. But I think there's, there's a huge influence with the brain. I mean, why do people get through these physical adversities in these events and, um, you know, tackle these huge challenges? I think it's the power of our brain, and sometimes it works against us when, we, <laughs> when it says, hey, we've made the finish line, you know, you can stop. <clears throat> now tell me about the uh, Spartathlon. This was created out of celebration of uh, is it Phidippides, the original yes, exactly. runner. Exactly, and that's, it's interesting, you know, there, there's really, as much as everybody knows Pheidippides from the marathon and being the first marathoner, there's no historical record that he actually ran from uh, marathon to Athens, and you know, what he has, you know, in terms of done, in terms of historical record, has run from Athens to Sparta, and he, he did that because he was trying to get word, the Persians were attacking Athens, and the Athenians needed backup reserves, so they called upon Pheidippides, and back then, in Greek times, they had foot messengers. It was the the best way to get message from one place to another, even though there were horses, of course. Um, horses were typically too loud. Um, you couldn't travel in, you know, really low-lying brush and, you know, basically stay hidden. So he ran the, the distance from Athens to Sparta to get word to the Spartans to basically provide backup reserves while the Athenians were being attacked by the Persians. So. Right. His his goal was to travel this distance, and the race commemorates that route that he ran from Athens to Sparta. Now, unfortunately, it's it was all 100, it was 140 152 miles. 152 miles. 152. 152. So it's uh, um, quite the distance, and in fact, he ran all the way to Sparta. The Spartans uh, told him that, sorry, we're having a religious festival. We can't, <laughs> yeah. can't, uh, can't come right now. So he actually had to turn around and deliver the message uh. back to the Athenians. And um, thankfully, we only go one direction um, these mm. days, although... One of these, uh, one of these years, would be fun to you know, try and retrace the route and go backwards. But um, it's an amazing event. Uh, the Greek people, even though it's not necessarily a running culture, mm-hmm. like of you know, some countries that we know for their running uh, prowess, the, the Greeks really get into the event. And you know, I think it's just that Olympic spirit. They understand, um, mm-hmm. you know, the, the importance of endurance and the importance of celebrating these events. And just just an amazing event running through these small ancient uh, villages and places such as ancient Corinth, um, which people are familiar with, you know, yes. Corinthians and in the Bible. And they, there's just, you know, all these places you go through in uh, Nemea, which is where they held the Olympic Games uh, on years that they couldn't hold them in Olympia. So you've got this historical um, route, basically landscape that you're running through in this route that just just makes it an amazing experience. And you know, I've, course, been, I've been to Sparta, and I was shocked uh, because I'd always heard of things being Spartan, and I expected it to be this rough, ugly uh, country, and <laughs> desert, it's really very yeah. beautiful. I mean, once uh, you get over the mountains and get down into that bowl at Sparta, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, definitely. And you mm-hmm. you could see the ruggedness of mm-hmm. you know the people, and like you say, the Spartan mm-hmm. life maybe comes from the mountainous terrain. It's it's very rugged, but mm-hmm. at the same time, it's it's gorgeous. And you can see how you know thousands of years ago it it was uh, mm-hmm. you know a center for not only training some of the best warriors, but you know the, the civilization where you know it was democratic society and you know people you know had amazing uh, agriculture uh, down in that valley and. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing, and and the people of Sparta still hold that pride, and and that's one thing that you notice in Greece. They they pride themselves in their their cultures and their traditions and their diet, and you know just the food element is is really apparent in, in Greece. And yeah, I just love love going back there. So, is there a lot of uso at the finish line? Plenty of uso. Um, in fact, there's two. Uh, this is where the Greeks they love to celebrate uh, yeah, do, things, yeah. and you know we celebrate in Sparta. There's a huge, you know, firework display. I mean, all this for a running event. You know, that's 152 miles. It's it's pretty amazing. Even in the U.S., we don't have firework displays after. And then they they hold another award celebration in Athens two days later. So um, they celebrate in, in Athens as well. So we're not uh, just celebrating in Sparta. So it's it's really neat how they kind of. So you have to run that in that culture. You have to run it in 24 hours. So I know the race um, has a time limit of 36 hours, and I my fastest time on the course is just over 22 hours, 22 hours and Ooh. 25 minutes. Ooh. So it's <laughs> wow. uh, yeah, it's 
And every time I think of it, it's it's one of those races where, in the moment, you just realize how tough it is. Uh-huh. You know, just how far you you go. But uh, you remember those experiences, and you know, they're just something I'll cherish for the rest of my life. Well, you said as you were running that that you got sleepy, and I I found that. Uh, kind of confusing I, I can't imagine that you can run and be sleepy too it's very surprising i used to think for years that you know people would describe you know sleep running or you know falling asleep while running i was like there's just no way you know, you know when your body is moving and engaged in that type of exercise how could you actually be sleepy and i i experienced it firsthand uh, in spartathlon where literally at 2 two thirty in the morning I was um, I just slapped my face to stay awake. I was literally mm-hmm. dozing off and you know nodding off, and <laughs> it was one of the weirdest experiences I've had. But it definitely can happen. And you know, at two thirty in the morning after running one hundred twenty, one hundred thirty type miles, for the most part you're not moving super fast. Um, and I had just gotten into this really you know drowsy, sleepy mm-hmm. state. And uh, yeah, it definitely can happen. It sounds sounds bizarre, but. Yeah. It happens. That along with the hallucinations, mm-hmm. um, the uh, that can be a factor for sure. Can you, um, when you run, can you stop and rest? Can you take a nap? You you can. I mean, the clock is always running, and uh-huh. for somebody like myself who's trying to you know compete at the top and win these races, it, it would be really hard to sit down and sleep at the Spartathlon. I mean, mm-hmm. you could take maybe a cat nap and wake up and get going again, but. You know, keep in mind your competitors are right there. In fact, a lot mm. of these races, um, even a hundred miles into the Spartathlon, I've been neck and neck with runners and um, literally been, you know, dueling it out towards the mm-hmm. end. Um, it's not typically a sprint finish. Usually, right. <laughs> something happens where somebody drops back. But yeah. Uh, yeah, you take a nap, and some individuals do. I mean, there are races such as the, like the Hard Rock 100, which I describe in Eat and Run as well. It's literally a race that people get two days to finish you know badwater um the time limit used to be 60 hours i think it's now 48 but Mm. those individuals who are out there just trying to make the cutoffs and just trying to get to the finish line Mm. um they definitely do take some naps Mm. um they'll they'll stop in an aid station sit down you know maybe eat a meal instead of just you know grabbing aid station food or you know grabbing sports food and gels and, and drinks so it definitely varies depending upon what your goals are my son is 12, and he's in track, and he read your book. I gave it to him, and he loved it. Uh, he found it very inspirational, and uh, so he's got a, a plan for, you know, training this summer so he'll be better in track uh, next year. He's uh, he's thinking of long distance and that sort of thing. So what advice do you give to, to yeah. kids like that uh, that are starting out? What's, what's your advice to them about training? I think the biggest thing is make sure they have fun. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as a as a young kid, I, I ran a couple of, you know, kids one-mile races just because, you know, back then I, I thought it was fun, and then later I got into sports such as baseball, basketball, soccer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I ran to stay in shape, but I, I actually didn't like running. You know, I mm-hmm. went went out for one season of track. So, you know, I, I found or re-found running later in life and, you know, started to really – enjoy it. So I think with kids and with young people, it's really important to make sure they're having fun. And, uh, and I'm, I meet young people all the time when I'm out speaking across mm-hmm. the country. And, you know, it's really neat to see kids, you know, in their, you know, early years, especially, you know, five, six to, you know, on up into their teens, just be so jazzed about running. And I think that's what's really key is to keep them interested in that. As far as ultra marathoning, going longer distances, I try to recommend to you the the young gals and guys that you've got plenty of time to run ultra marathons. You mm-hmm. only have so much time for your speed. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> nowadays, uh, me for, to do a mile or two mile event and some of these shorter events that you know, of course, kids do in junior high and high school track. You know, it gets it gets to be real really tough to have that speed for mm-hmm. those distances. So I always tr- tell kids, you know, save the long stuff for later. You know, I started when I was twenty running ultra marathons and. You know, I think, you know, post-college or if somebody's like, you know what, I'm just not into college cross-country or track, I want to do something different, then, you know, go into the marathon, ultra-marathon type stuff. But I think when they're young, it's, it's key that they just keep running fun and just, you know, keep variety, get on the trails and, you know, do those. I think it's totally fine to do, you know, 7, 8, 10, 12-mile, um, you know, runs out on the trails nice and easy. And when I traveled to Ethiopia a few months ago, you know, young people 
run to and from, you know, just for transportation to school, yeah. to, you know, the village. And that's what I think kids need to be doing. You know, long distances are fine for that type of stuff, but to go out and run a 50 kilometer race when they're, when they're really young, I don't think it's necessarily harmful, but I always try them, you know, what's your goals? Do you want to run high school or, mm-hmm. you know, college track cross country? You might want to keep to the, the short stuff and just do the long uh, runs out in the trails and on dirt for fun and, and just keep that fun for a while. Well, speaking of fun, the Tarahumara Indians that you ran with down in Copper Canyon, uh, they're a culture of runners. They they run for different reasons than most people. And so you were quite impressed with them as a culture, right? Yeah, I've, you know, I've always been fascinated with, you know, groups and, you know, historically, you know, tribes that they're, you know, been Incan fish runners who had run long distances down in, of course, the Andes. And mm-hmm. uh, there are, you know, groups such as the Marathon Monks of Mahie in Japan where, you know, running is, is part of the spiritual practice. And then, of course, you have the Taramarans who, you know, just do it out of transportation and the Greeks, you know, mm-hmm. the foot messengers. And mm-hmm. I've always been fascinated with, you know, running cultures mm-hmm. and, you know, keeping them alive. And when I had the opportunity to go down to the Copper Canyon and, and run with and race against the Taramara, I, you know, had to take up that opportunity because, you know, it was I've always wanted to visit, you know, these ancient canyons and, and just be able to experience that. And that's really what was the, I guess, highlight of the trip is, you know, spending a, you know, basically a 30-mile hike and run with these Taramarans and spending a whole week with them and just hanging out, even though there was a major language barrier. Mm-hmm. Just sharing that experience of running and, you know, watching them move and, you know, watching what they ate and, mm-hmm. and how they moved, it, it was it was like going back in time. It was basically like transporting myself. Basically, these are people living the same way that their ancestors have for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And the first so, time the first time you ran with them, you lost. Yeah, in fact, I, um, I uh, you know, of course, it's you know, detailed in Born to Run. Mm-hmm. I basically came up uh, second place, and, you know, they, they are very talented. And, mm-hmm. you know, Caballo Blanco, who set up the race, he, his whole goal was to, you know, pit the best Taramarans mm-hmm. up against some of the best U.S. runners, and it was, it was really neat to run on their turf. And I had raced the tar, a different group of Taramarans up in mm-hmm. California at a race mm-hmm. called the Angels Crest 100, and I mentioned this in Eat and Run, how I raced against them. But, you know, Caballo would always tell me, oh, no, you got to race against these guys are the real deal. You know, you got to race against got these the guys. And, yeah, the A team. So we, you know, basically he set that up, and, yeah. you know, it was, you know, as much as the race was fun to yeah. see how I would do, you know, these these people just hanging out with them and hiking mm-hmm. and, and, and running and just spending time with them was really, I think, something that I'll, I'll remember most. Well, the, the, we, haven't even, we haven't even gotten to your diet, but you're uh, a vegetarian primarily, right? Or 100%? Yeah, I'm 100% uh, vegan, which you know is fully plant-based. Mm-hmm. And I'm a... I'm originally a Minnesota hunting and fishing boy. <laughs> I mentioned this neat run where it's just you know, blasphemy. I, I tell you, it's blasphemy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's definitely never. And I, I think you know that's the testament. That's why you know the eat part of the book. You know, mm-hmm. it's eat and run. Eat and uh, run. Two mm-hmm. two major you know aspects of my life. I you know changed my diet in my uh, my late college years, and basically uh, as I started realizing you know the role of you know food and nutrition and it was something that, that was instilled in me from my grandparents and my mother who you know was a home ec teacher and but seeing all the chronic disease you know my mother had multiple sclerosis and I mm. you know go into depth about this and you know my life story and eat and run and seeing chronic disease in the family and then later when I was going through physical therapy school seeing chronic disease in the hospitals and seeing what you know people were fed in hospitals and you know, things just started to click, and then I read Dr. Andrew Weil's book, Spontaneous Healing and Eight Weeks to Optimum Health, and then later on, Matt Cowboy, which was a, he's a, basically Howard Lyman's a third-generation cattle rancher gone vegan, and I thought, okay, if this cattle rancher is going vegan, then this doctor's talking about the, you know, the intrinsic healing potential of the body and diet's role in that. I needed to make some changes, because at that time, I was eating fast food four or five times a week, um, you know, just pretty much eating um, the standard uh, college student diet and uh, standard American diet in a lot of ways. So for me, it was this, I guess, reawakening. And that's really what the book is about, is this journey with food and this journey with running, two things that I 
never thought I would be doing. You know, if somebody had said, you know, 20 years from now you're going to be plant-based and you're going to be running ultramarathons, I would have never thought that. Well, that's why it's a wonderful book, because it's a surprising journey on both those levels of what's capable, what man is capable of, and, and what food can get him there. So the book is Eat and Run by Scott Jurek, one of the world's top ultra marathoners. Thank you, Scott, for joining us today. I appreciate you stopping running long enough to talk to us. Well, thank you very much. And if people want more info as well as the trailer on the book um, and details about the book, they can go to my website, scottdirect.com, and uh, check it out there. It's in e-format as well as um, uh, digital and audio. So Perfect. Check it out. That's great. Paperback and hardback. Thanks for having me. It's, okay. it's been a pleasure. Thank you. If you missed part of this or any other show, or you just want to share a good book with a friend, like us on Facebook at Good Books Radio. 